our Educating the Idiot series, we've been going through this whole process of learning that there are certain techniques that are done in logic and debate that are used against us in order to cause us to believe in something that, on the one hand, sounds true, may even have some evidence or evidentiary propondering to be true, but as we've been examining, we found out that not only is it not true, but sometimes truth is used to confuse the fact that error is added in order to make the conclusions that we're drawing from it wrong. And they're trying to say that it's right. Now, that may sound confusing to you, but it's being done every day of your life. <laughs> Frankly, advertising does it, business does it, big business does it, the government does it, people do it, we do it, you do it, I do it. We all do it in some form and fashion. When you examine fallacies, you begin to understand in logic the way that our structured words are designed in a certain way to cause us to react and to act in patterns that are predictable. And that's why people have come up with these ways of identifying certain things that if someone's trying to manipulate you, you'll be able to say, ah, I get it. You're trying to pull the wool over my eyes. I know better than that. And you won't be deceived. So as we've been studying this, educating the idiot, setting up for the study of informal fallacy and formal fallacy, which we're getting into later, that um, after this series is done, we've done, I think, 1 of 6, 2 of 6, now this is 3 of 6, that we'll be teaching, taking examples, and as we looked at them earlier, we were talking about other ways that, you know, scriptural and religious um, language has been used in order to produce fallacies that you believe in. Sometimes saying things like, oh, I don't know, God closes one door, he opens another. That's not true. I mean, that's called a fallacy because it's not a scripture, it's not a fact. There's not even really any scriptural basis for it, but I could tell you the scriptures that are used for it, you know, that God has presented before you an open door, and after that people just say, oh, well, you know, because it's an open door, we can say anything we want after that. No, the open door is for one reason, and that's the reason that God specifies it and uses it in scripture for a particular purpose. That reality of opening and closing doors is a mixture of two or three scriptures where people are trying to say something about how or the nature of God, and then they wind up distorting God and making him into an understandable image that they want to keep God in, where it's only good things happen to you, rather than God could say, no, and close the door, and not open another door, because you're in sin, or whatever reason he wants. So you see, lots of times there are different ways that even in religion there is fallacy happening, uh, misconceptions uh, misinterpretation of the way that people are presenting information to you that sometimes even in teaching you're going to learn as you study the Educating Idiot series that in identifying these fallacies that we're going through that you'll be able to learn how to study scriptures without deceiving yourself or in other words being deceived by someone who might be sincerely believing what they believe to be true and that's kind of what happens in fallacy sometimes the person using fallacy or a way or methodology of logic really is what we call a true believer. They believe what they're saying and they believe the way they're doing it. But the truth is, when you come to the light, it's false. And that's why we want to present this, you know, the third part of our series, you know, of six, to educate you, not meaning you're an idiot, but to retrain your mind to be able to look and see those things. Because just like subliminal perceptions, there used to be this whole bad advertising going on in society that in the 60s and 70s there was naked men and women being put up on ice cubes and mixed in with little advertising gimmicks so that you didn't even know you were seeing it. But it persuaded you to observe the product a little closer because advertising had found out that subliminal advertising was not perceptive to the eye but that it was programmable to the subliminal mind and people would react to it. Nowadays, with our exposés and the internet and everything else, it's not quite as obvious, but it is being done, and it's being done to you every day. So, in our first, I guess, first two series, we had talked about emotional language and faulty distribution, invalid sampling, uh, reductio ad absurdum, uh, evasion of truth, non sequiturs, 
lesser of two evils, false dilemmas, appeals to moderation, Hegel's fallacy, appeal to causatory, and formal fallacy. Now we're in our third part. So we're going to just say them and then I'll go over them briefly so that we can just move on and get on to the fourth and fifth and sixth, you know, and get out of this so we can move on to individual specifics. Because by the time that we get through this series, we're going to have the chalkboard up or at least the whiteboard. And we're going to go through individual words and show you how it's done and how it's being misconstrued and how we'll have a scriptural application of it as well as in business or in life, you know, and what you can look at and see and then go, oh, that's what they did. I see. That's politics. Yeah, of course. Politicians are famous for saying things that aren't true and always hiding the rest of the story. There used to be a Lowell Thomas, I believe, was one of the first to actually tell you the full story. And then later there was a radio talk show broadcaster that used to do the news and tell you the rest of the story. And I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now, but he would always tell you the facts that were surrounding some of the headlines or some of the people that you didn't know and you'd find it that's why they do what they do, or that's how come that works out that way. And you'd go, wow, that was interesting. And that's what learning fallacy does for you. It gives you the rest of the story. So, let's get into it. And we call this uh, dishonest tricks of argument. And I like to give credit where credit is due. So, we have taken this, watching for sophistry. Sophistry is, you know, sophisticated way of educating, or sophistry... Sophistry is an educated way of using logic against a person when they don't know what the tricks of argumentation are and they try to use logic against them in a way that presents some error or some error in thinking so that the person goes along with you until they're convinced that you're right when in reality they were. So taking these papers or pages was from a website called Hebrew for Christians which also took it from another website which was about logic and it was taken from... I believe uh, Robert Thulis of uh, Straight and Crooked Thinking. And it is um, Dishonest Tricks of Argumentation. And there are 38 of them, and we've been going through about six or seven of them at a time. That's why there's only six of them. You know, it's like you know, approximately you know, six or seven at a time. And so it's taken from Hebrew for Christians, which you can look at www.hebrew, H E B R E W, for, with the number, and in Christian, C H R I S T I A N S, which is uh, John. I believe, if I can remember his name, unfortunately, I'm kind of always having to refer to it because I always forget it. John Parsons, and he's dynamic Christian, a Jew, and he's very good at logic and debate, and he's uh, very honest and sincere about all of his articles, and so if you'd like to read them, it's under a place on the webpage, which looks exactly like this page, and it says Clear Thinking, and you would go to Clear Thinking, and then you would click on 38... Dishonest Tricks of Argument, and then you could print it out, look at it, or examine it. Later we'll be going through the same material, but it'll be in a more in-depth way that's listed under Clear Thinking, but it's got more of the informal fallacies and formal fallacies. So if you want to do it yourself, you can go ahead. It's all free. And then you can enjoy it and see what we're talking about. So in regards to that dishonest tricks of argument, let's see how dishonest people have been to you and how dishonest they are using certain techniques in order to persuade you of things that aren't true. One of the... <laughs> it's always interesting because whenever I get ready to record this, I always find that somebody used some of these on me or tried to and I just pulled out my little checklist and said, look, this is what you're doing, this is where it's from, this is how it accomplished, this is what it's said to do in order to show you, in order to prove that you're wrong and that you're just using this technique and that I know it and you know it, so why are you doing it? You know, <laughs> But uh, I don't always do that. Sometimes I just let them go and just say, look, I understand fallacy, and then they quit doing it. You know, And they just, oh, if he knows fallacy, he's, you know, we, we're not going to trick him. You know, We're just going to have to try to persuade him some other way <laughs> or ignore me completely. So the first one is called false continuity. <laughs> The use of the fact of continuity between them to throw doubt on a real difference between two things, the argument of the beard, which the point is to point out the difference is nevertheless real. This again may be made stronger by pointing out that the application of the same method of argument could deny the difference between black and white or between hot and cold. In other words, sometimes people use in this methodology that's called false continuity is to say that 
this, it's almost like A plus B equals C. That's kind of like a false continuity. But what they're doing is they're using kind of a false comparative. They're saying, well, good is good, so, you know, kind of like this. Here's, here's the way it is. We're conservatives. So because we're conservatives, we believe in this, this, and this. So because we're conservatives, this, this, and this means that you have to believe this if you're a conservative. Because, after all, over here, they're not conservative. They believe in this, this, and this, and they can't be right because they're not conservative. That's false continuity because, you see, the person that's not a conservative could be right. They could have a valid point. But you're not willing to accept the valid point because you've already been told this list of false continuous things to prove that, A, a conservative doesn't accept a non-conservative point of view, which is false, or that, B, you have to agree to all these points to be a conservative. You see how both of those are false? You don't have to agree to anything to be a conservative. I can be a conservative and agree that someone who's not a conservative may come up with the right conclusion and the right statement and the right methodology of going somewhere and doing something because it doesn't matter whether you're conservative or not conservative. Then what matters is whether you're correct or not. You see, it's kind of like with a doctor and a Christian. Which would you rather have? A doctor who's been trained in medicine for, you know, 20 years, you know, doing surgery on you that you know you need, like having an appendix? Or would you like to have, you know, a Christian who's just suddenly discovered that, you know, he's got an ability to cut up frogs and he wants to go ahead and cut you up, you know, and take out your appendix? Because he's a Christian, you go with him. That's a false continuity. That goes to reasoning by thinking, well, since he's a Christian, God must be on their side, so they must be right, because I don't want to go with the ungodly, non-Christian. Because, you see, that's kind of what people have done to Dr. Oz in a lot of his medicine. They said, oh, he's an Eastern believer or something. He doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe like we do. He wants to teach us to diet and take care of ourselves before we need a doctor and take a pill. Right. <laughs> so you got all these Christians who went after Dr. Oz because they said, oh, well, he's an Oprah person. You know, oh, God forbid that you know, he could be right because he was on a show called Oprah. But because of the association, they say he's wrong. And that's called, I mean, there's more than one in that case, but that would be a perfect example of false continuity. Thinking something is true by way of people reasoning that, well, because he was on Oprah, he can't be true. Personally, I've looked at just about everything that Dr. Voss has taught in medicine and teaching us about how to take care of ourselves, and I'd go for it. <laughs> That's a good example of false continuity. Somebody trying to deceive you by reasoning with you in a false way because they are biased. And that's where they don't realize they're using illogic or using false reasoning or false logic dishonestly to trick you into rejecting something that's good for you. Another dishonest trick is inadequate definition. An illegitimate use of or demand for definition. <laughs> The approach is if an opponent opposes definitions to produce clear-cut conceptions for facts which are not clear, it is necessary to point out to him how much more complicated facts are in reality than is thought. It's this whole idea that people try to say on one hand, keep it simple stupid, by using a word that's bigger and broader than what they really mean because if you really define the word, you recognize that it includes more than what they said. They are defining the word only partially. They're saying a little bit of it. It's kind of like, let me think of one just for a sec. I'll try to picture one in my mind if I can real fast. An in inadequate definition, I'm thinking of religious ones because I hear them all day long, you know, constantly. People saying these words that they think they know what they mean, and they don't. You know, like, the most common ones are like salvation, redemption, you know, propitiation, you know, um, faith. You know, you, you name it. I mean, all of those are just simple terms, it sounds like, on the surface. And some people say, well, faith is, and then they come up with some shoot, cute little definition that doesn't cover all of faith or doesn't cover all of what we're talking about. Or like when someone says, a Christian, you know, true Christianity. Well, there is no such thing as true Christianity. Christianity is Christianity. That's what it is. It's a religion. And then they go, well, no, it's a relationship. No, that's an inadequate definition. You see, Christianity is not a religion only, it's not a relationship only. It is so much more because it incorporates both. You have to define between you what you're agreeing on that the definition of Christianity is in order to have a discussion. And that's why inadequate definition often cuts off people from being able to discuss to each other because we could say the same words but we don't mean the same thing. I'll give you a good example. I believe in Jesus and let's be honest with you, 
The Mormon says, I believe in Jesus. Now, an inadequate definition goes with, yeah, you both believe in Jesus, so you're both Christian. No. You see, the Mormon definition of who Jesus is, is a being who was created just like Satan was created, and because they're both created, they are ascending up into godlike stature, and that if they're good enough, if they are holy enough, if they do all that they're supposed to do, they become godlike. And then they get, at some point in time, possibly, you know, their own world, their own little universe, they get to do their own little thing, you know, with all the little peoples. Here is the God, and here is the peoples, and they get to be who he wants to be. <laughs> Which is kind of like the army. Be who all you can be, you know, except for it's a Mormon way. So guess what? You get to be God. No, that's not really the Jesus I know, so that's an inadequate definition. Now, my Jesus is called the Son of God. He is the only begotten Son of God who was conceived of the Virgin Mary, born by way of the initiation of the Holy Spirit that came, overcame Mary and somehow, you know, caused her to have a child that a body that was prepared for me, you know, and he inhabited it, but he came down as God into man, became fully human, fully alive, fully man, so that he became the son of man, but at the same time was still the son of God, so that he could take away the sins of the world, because to be anything less would not be a sacrifice for sin and would not be the propitiation of sin. So. The Jesus that the Mormons are talking about doesn't take away sin, so they got to do all those special rites, special privileges, baptize the dead, and do all kinds of weird things, you know, that they get into, because it's not Jesus dying for their sins. It's some other guy that they made up in order to fit their theology. That's what you call an inadequate definition. You both say Jesus, but you're not saying the same person, <laughs> and that's why the inadequate definition gets sometimes people put on the hot seat by people who are non-Christians. They say, well, you both say Jesus, so what's the problem? Inadequate definition. That's it, pure and simple. Then we get into the big one. Ooh, drum roll. The true believer. <laughs> uh, true believers scare me, you know, because cult leaders are true believers. Mormons are true believers. I mean, a lot of these people really believe what they're saying, you know. That's the scary part. Not only that, sometimes women, wives' tales, men, men's tales, and all the other stuff that comes in between, frankly, are true believers because they really believe what they're saying. That scares me. You know, like the guy that says, well, I think that, you know, President Obama, you know, is a Muslim. No, he's not. He doesn't even have a clue, pardon me, of what to do in a Muslim temple. <laughs> he was in a church. That's what a true believer tells you, that he's a Muslim, and they believe it. Or the birthers, they're true believers. They are so wrong. It is so foolish, and it is so stupid that we're going back to the man in the moon and cheese, you know, because it's not factual. There isn't any logic, there isn't any proof, and there isn't any way to convince these people because they are true believers. They really believe whatever they want to see in order to believe. That's why they call it true believer, because every time you have to put the word true on it, it's false. Just like a true Christian, true religion, true faith, this is true God, this is true Jesus, this is true redemption, true salvation. No, it's all false. As soon as you got to add the adjective, you're already trying to prove something that isn't true. Sorry, that's the whole point of fallacy. You don't have to qualify it. It is true by way of its own definition, or it's not. You don't add a definition to it in order to make it true. You see what the problem is? Don't put the word true on it. So True Believer says, suggestion by repeated affirmation, suggestion by use of a confident manner, ha, well, don't you know? Just like that. Ha, well, we know. No, we don't. Whenever they use the word we know, that's actually a different logic trick, but the attitude that's behind it is called True Believer. Um, suggestion by prestige. My, or as a pastor, that's also a false assertion because then they use the office of the pastor to try to assert the truth and that's called a true believer trick by putting a THD, a PhD, their prestige in front of it by saying that because I am such and such, this is true. Baloney! Any idiot could be wrong and a donkey could be right. You see, because, pardon me, but the idiot that was Balaam was wrong and the donkey who was a jackass was right. Hey, you know what? <laughs> the true believer, huh, Balaam, was wrong. <laughs> Because he just kept meeting that donkey until finally the donkey said, Look, I don't know where you're going, but I ain't going there. <laughs> you know, man, I'm trying to save your life and you're trying to get killed. Hello. 
That's the problem with true believers. They use trickery or technique in order to subvert the truth. Prophecy people do that a lot. Prophecy websites do that continuously. There is so much false prophecy stuff out there that they put a name on their news service and call it Prophecy Today or Prophecy you know, 101 or, or End of the World or End Times or Watcher or Prophet or this or Prophetess. And then they make some bold, rash statement that comes out of nowhere and you're supposed to believe it because they have the word prophetess, prophecy, prophet this, prophet that, or end times, or eschatology, or whatever on it. And it's false. You proved it. The best safeguard against all three of these tricks of suggestion is the theoretical knowledge of suggestion, so that their use may be detected. All three devices lose much of their effect if the audience see how the effect is being obtained. So merely pointing out the fact that the speaker is trying to create conviction by repeated assertion in a confident manner may be enough to make this device ineffective. Ridicule is often used to undermine the confident manner or any kind of criticism which makes the speaker begin to grow angry or plaintive. One of the popular things that's happening right now is in politics is, to put it bluntly, between two people is Mitt Romney constantly asserting that he's a true conservative. <laughs> which he's using true believer because he's got this confident attitude until people start challenging him and then he gets pissed off and he gets angry and he gets mad and then he's caught in this kind of reactionary thing and that shows the weakness of his own position because he knows who he is but he can't say it because that won't get him elected so unfortunately most politicians can't just level with the crowd because they're trying to appeal to too many people Instead of just saying, look, here I am, you like it or you don't. Ron Paul's kind of like one of those, love it or leave it, you know. He'll state to you exactly where he's at, which is why he won't get elected. Because <laughs> he'll tell you, this is where I'm at. You want this, this is how you do it. I'll get that, but then he adds all the other junk and he's a true believer. He believes in what he says and he tells you right straight up. And at the same time, he's being deceptive in some ways because he knows there's no way that he could do what some of the things he's claimed to do once he got elected. Unfortunately, Mitt Romney in his assertion of positiveness thinks that he's going to automatically get things because he just has the attitude. Both are true believers and that's what politics does lots of times. Tries to persuade you by the strength of their attitude or assertions or constantly saying the same thing over again. True Believers has so much in it that it's just amazing to me how many of it or how much of it is used in Christianity over and over again, even in the pulpit, to a constant, you know, repetitious cycle. I would give every single pastor and teacher, you know, a class on fallacy to prevent them from doing what they're doing so that they would be more honest and sincere about how they're teaching the Word of God rather than to get into Lots of times using pulpit commentaries or pulling up some little short, you know, cute thing they find on the web and then making it into some little quick story, you know, that they're going to add to their sermon in order to have their outline complete. And then they got this little way of technique of memorization and then it's just like rote and it goes right through this cycle, you know, and it's just like, oh, he's so smooth. He's so slick. Yeah, he is. Pardon, pardon me, but... There's a reason why they're slick and capable and able to present that kind of information in that way. True believer. And fallacy. Where I would say, look, do what Jesus said. Don't prepare. Walk out there, you know, maybe for a year. Practice that. Walk out consistently every time, not preparing ahead of time, asking God, the Holy Spirit, to lead you and teach you what he wants you to say at that moment. Then just go out and do it. Then once you've gone through one year of that, then go back to what you're doing. Because then you know there's a difference. Because you'll see that there's an anointing on the Holy Spirit dependency and a appointing of where you put someone in office and they get away with it anyways. You know, where Saul kind of like the anointing came on and he was good for you know however long he was good. And then when it kind of wore off, guess what? He was out to kill David. Well, David was like, I'm seeking God all the time, so I'm sticking with what he tells me to do. Kind of two different angles, approaches for religious presentation with which we call exegetical studies or Bible studies or sermons or presentations of information or biblical Bible studies or however you want to call it. In The next one is invalid authority. Prestige by false credentials. Well, I'm a prophet. Sure you are. <laughs> yeah, you've been set down. We examined everything that you've ever said that you're pr true and everything that you say you're willing to risk your life on and we're going to stone you if you're dead. You know, Stone you dead if you're wrong. No. 
false credentials, invalid authority. They always try to speak with the word of God and say, you know, thus saith the Lord. You know, the scriptures warn you, anyone that says thus saith the Lord is wrong. Automatically, first right off the bat. Now it's kind of like they got this dreamology going on where it's like, hey, I went to heaven, oh, I went to hell, oh, I went here, I went there. And they'll contradict scripture by their accounts of it, and they claim authority because they got popular. Or, you know, kind of like, you know, people, I've even had someone accuse me one time where I said, they said, well, you know, who are you? And I said, well, you know, I said, I've been on the internet a long time. I said, tell you what, Google me. You know, it's easier. Just go Google my name and you'll find all my material. You know, it's easier that way than to, you know, try to sit here and say, well, you know, in this short comment, I'm going to, in two sentences, before you, you know, pass on to looking at some other picture or doing something else on the web, answer your question. So I just say, Google it. You know, I've got seven networks. I've got blogs. I've got websites. I've got videos. I've said, I've got all this stuff that you can go and find out information before you believe anything I say. And even then, I wouldn't believe what I have to say. I'm just here to inspire you and to relate to you information so that you could go to God with it and talk to Him about it. And they go, well, you're full of pride. Why? <laughs> I said, first of all, if you watch video, you'll automatically, one of these videos, you'll know I'm not full of pride because, frankly, you know, <laughs> hello, look, you know, it's me, I'm just me, you know, there's nobody special here. But, you know, they make those accusations and unfortunately in invalid authority, other people will do the opposite, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I have a church. Well, yes, yeah, so? <laughs> doesn't mean you have a good church, doesn't mean you have a bad church, just means... God has a church and he's using you to fill the blank, you know, that he needs for somebody to teach the people in order to be inspired at that moment that you give to them the word of God so that God could use someone up there to at least look like the image of the incorruptible son of God because you're obviously corruptible, but God in his way of mercy and grace has caused you to shine like a light forth in the wilderness, shining to the people and they're being brought to God by you in order that you might be bearing witness that it's no longer you that liveth, but Christ liveth in you and that the life that you now live in the flesh, you live by the will of the son of God who died for you and gave himself for you so that it's not your actions and it's not your words and it's not your ministry but it's God doing it in you. <laughs> People hate it when I can do that because they go, what do you say? <laughs> it's just all of it true. It's just flat regurgitating what I know from the facts that God has said in his word and has spoken forth in his declarations to everyone in the written word. You can do the same thing too if you're not using invalid authority. If you're just letting the Holy Spirit flow and go where he wants to go at any time that he wants to use you through your mouth, through your words, through your actions, and through your deeds. Simple. Turn over to him. Let him do it. So, invalid authority, just like it sounds, you know, anybody claiming to be something they're not, you know, and most people claim to be something they're not. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, most people are told buffalo your way in order to get the experience, you know, and buffalo your way into your job, you know, in order to get, you know, where you're at, you know, and most people realize that when you're in business, you know, most, you can tell the experts because they're the craftsmen and you can tell the people who are just faking it because they're talking a lot. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> But the craftsman, ooh, it's kind of like what I learned in business right off the bat. I, I, I applied to thousands of jobs. I've gotten lots of jobs. I've had, I've joined, or I've joined, I've been hired in fields I knew nothing about, but as soon as I got in, I saw the person who was an expert, watched them immediately, imitated what they had to, added my own insights into it, adapted it, and then moved on and actually achieved what I wanted to, and usually got a raise and performance review and everything else in 30 days wound up becoming good at the job that I didn't know how to do when I got there. And I loved it because I went into all kinds of fields of study. It was great. I mean, I enjoyed it. I just thought, man, if this is the way it is, I'll keep going. <laughs> okay. After invalid authority comes the next one that fits right in step by step with invalid authority that sometimes people, you know, accuse me of, but man, if they knew me in the old days, they would know I was that back then. <laughs> now, not. It's called use of technical jargon. It's kind of like when somebody throws at you, well, no, and then they say, that's tendentialism. Now, they don't bother explaining what tendentialism is, but they throw the technical term at you so that you believe it's tendentialism. Tendentialism is just a fancy word for saying, you made it up, and you put it in the Bible. That's all. That's all it is. Using technical terms without the explanation is use of technical jargon. It's meant to prestige by the use of pseudo-technical jargon or even making up words that sound right or scriptural or 
acronyms, you know, like, oh, I don't know, they've got all kinds of acronyms nowadays, you know, that aren't really necessarily always accurate, you know, that I was trying to think of one that's been out recently that, you know, you know what I mean, but, you know, Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth, that's not what the Bible is at all. It's the Word of God. To make it into the Bible, uh, basic instructions before leaving earth is absolutely false because it takes away from who it reveals, what it is, and what it was meant to do. It is the living Word of God given to you by the Son of God Himself that inspired by writers by the Holy Spirit was meant to instruct you in the way of righteousness. Everything that is used in that quote acronym Bible is false, but it sounds good because that's what the rapture people or somebody that was trying to get a point across used it once and then everybody caught on to it and made it, ooh, that's cute, let's keep pushing it. Then they started using it as a theology and then it became wrong. And that's the use of technical jargon, acronym, acronym, acronymizing or making acronyms out of words that don't fit theologically correct principles from the scripture. You're contradicting the Bible by your acronym. And so, also using big long words that are longer than four letters, you know, <laughs> you know, in order to prove a point. And that's when it's a false argument. You can use technical terms, there's nothing wrong with that, but you usually explain it in a way, but not as proof text. You use it as an explanation. Your proof text should always be the Word of God as it's written, where it's written, the way it's written. That's your proof. That's truth. Truth always stands by truth. Now, people will sometimes take it out of context and then it's not truth, but that's just out of contextualism. Or, like we say, um, uh, the other one that was kind of like out of order, non sequitur. So, having gone through the use of technical jargon, you already know, just trying to confuse you by using big words, you know, or actually using big words, but not to the right definition of them. A lot of people do that too. Right now, there's a big word that's used as a big fallacy, you know, that is a complete lie. Chrislam. There's no such thing. It's a made up word. It's a made up religion. It's a made up idea. It happened in Africa a long time ago. Some prophet was found, you know, to be teaching this idea of blending the two together, kind of like what they did in New Orleans, you know, with the voodoo cult, you know, that does uh, kind of like Catholic stuff, you know, and then does voodoo stuff, you know, and they put the two together and they, they call it Chris, Christophus or Christophus. There's more people in that voodoo cult than there is in Chrislam. And yet, you hear all these prophecy sites and all these people going, Oh my God, Chrislam is taking over America. No, it's not. It's used as a boogeyman issue to hide the bias and prejudice that the person feels against a Muslim or an Islam religion because they're trying to create this fear. And it's part of the end time scenario that people would fear and run when there's no lion. It's kind of like the proverb that says, you know, the people flee when there is no reason or the people flee the lion when there's no lion. You know, the people run for no reason. It's called fear-mongering. It's the idea of creating an atmosphere of fear and they don't realize they're doing it. They're fulfilling prophecy. They've given themselves over to a false idea, a fallacy, and then created this fear and now they're part of it. They can't get themselves out of it. They're not extricating themselves or looking at how it got started, whether it's true or not, and then just going, well, that's dumb. <laughs> kind of like I do. Every time somebody writes something about Chris, I go, well, that's dumb. Do you know how many people are in it? 200 in America. That's it. That's the number that's been proven factual. The rest of it is just being used as a boogeyman. False humility is the next one. False humility is the affectation of failure to understand back by prestige. False humility is tough because on the one hand there are people that probably are being sincere, you know, like the true believers, but they're not really humble. You know, they're kind of like, you know, saying, well, you know, when I was young and dumb, you know, I used to do that, but now that I'm here, you know, I'm not that way, you know, but I understand where you're coming from. You see how that asserted itself above you, you know, it went down, kind of went back over, and now it's on top of you? Because it kind of acts like, well, now I'm better, but I was like you once. And it's kind of a tricky technique, false humility. There are lots of techniques that are used to it, you know, like politicians will do this, you know, they'll go take off their coat, you know, and, you know, unbutton their shirt, and then suddenly they're one of the guys, you know. They don't wear their suit and tie, you know, because they're trying to get your vote. So they go to, 
you know, blue collar workers or whatever they call them nowadays, you know, white collar workers, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, <laughs> no collar workers, you know, poor people, <laughs> no, they don't go to poor people. But the point is, that's a false humility when they dress themselves down in order to look like what they're not. Pardon me, but, you know, some of these guys are wealthy and rich and they don't get caught dead walking out of their building or their apartment without wearing suits, ties, and, you know, $200, $2,000, whatever. Or like the guy that, you know, got the $6,000 haircut. You know, I mean, they always look perfect because when they want to look down and get kind of like with you, you know, and trying to connect with you, they're using a technique of fallacy called false humility. And that's the way it is, you know. I mean, you kind of should be able to see through it, but unfortunately, because the person's likable, or they have charisma, then that false humility doesn't seem so bad. So you kind of like accept it. And you kind of like take it in and that's how you are deceived. Because then you make that initial connection rather than accept or reject a person on the valid merits of their statements. And that's what God wants to teach us. Is that everything isn't based on tricks and techniques. The reality of light is that when the light is shined upon it and we have knowledge, then when we can see these things and we know that people are using it, we become wise and we look at it and we say, look, we don't need to be convinced by these tricks and techniques of argument. Let's see what the facts are once we cut out all the false fallacy. And if it still stands, then it's true. And most of the time, and it's just a bottom line fact, when you cut out all the junk, reduce it down to its base denominator, you'll find it's a lie. Whatever it is, whatever reason that the person has used fallacy or argumentation of these 38 tricks that we're talking about in some way, then they're trying to disguise a lie. They're trying to hide something. And that's the first thing that Jesus said that your sin will find you out, your lie will find you out, it will be revealed. And that's why fallacy is not a Christian methodology. We are meant to tell the truth and to wear that truth like a banner or like holding up our pants. Because if you don't have truth around you and you're used to hiding something or denying something or not being straight up obvious about it, you know, saying, hey, yeah, you know what, I screwed up, yeah, I did this, yeah, I'm a sinner, yeah, hey, I'll, I'll sin any chance I get, you know. <laughs> Or, you know, I try not to sin, but sometimes I get tripped up. You know, but, or because I know I sin, I stay away from it, you know, whatever. But whenever you try to hide something, that belt of truth comes off and you get caught with your pants down. That's the best way to look at it. Always keep truth around your waist, otherwise you're going to get caught with your pants down. Tell the truth, no matter what it is. Don't, don't be a white lie. Don't be a, keep it some of the truth. It's all truth because it will come out. It's obvious to God, then it's obvious to man. So, bluntly, you tell the truth. That's all. So, in fallacies, as we've been studying this, we've now gone through three of them, and I think we only have... I think Well, that says four or six, so I think that's three or six. I think we have two more to go. And um, maybe more, I don't know. I think that's three or four. I'll see when I put the title on this. Because <laughs> I really don't know. It's like, whoops, oh well, whichever number it was. But just recognize that this was an overview, this Educating the Idiot series, and that when we get in depth in it, going through each one of these step by step, it'll be you know a year study or more. But each segment will give you at least a good view of how to recognize, take apart. Maybe you want to use it on someone. I don't recommend it because God will bless you. Because I prayed over. It. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> sort of. But no, you know, you're learning things that will help you to identify when you're being lied to. And then it'll help you to communicate better because then you'll be honest with your partner, with your mate, with the person that you are sharing with, with your pastor, your teacher, your elder, your deacon, with your wife, your children, your husband, whoever it may be that you want to be intimate with because only in reality of the truth will we find that the truth has set us free indeed and whom the Son has set free, man, we don't need to be caught up in bondage of these kind of tricks and techniques that are being used every day on you to lead you astray.